Hello. Hello. Testing. One, two, three, four. Good.
Let me see you too. Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Uh, Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords.
Well, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> it's great to be back with you again today. I hear that Carolyn did a wonderful job last week in my place, so I appreciate her filling in and uh, appreciate all the prayers and the cards that you guys sent. I didn't have uh, as bad of a bout with COVID this time, but uh, yesterday was my first day out of uh, isolation, and even though the doctor says I'm free of contagiousness, um, I'm still testing positive, so I'm not going to shake hands, and I'm not going to do a kid's sermon, just out of abundance of caution. So, uh, But welcome to First Presbyterian Church of Dallas Center, and welcome all those who are watching online. Um, we appreciate you being here. Anytime that you're watching, you are a part of us as well. You belong here. And so, in the power of the Creator, in the peace of the Redeemer, and in the presence of the Holy Spirit, I welcome you. This morning, we have a few announcements, um, and we've got a few changes to the uh, order of worship. We had some scheduling conflicts that came up, so if you're someone who'd like to write down the hymn number, uh, our opening song is going to be hymn number 207. If you'd like to write that in your bulletin, we're going to announce it when it's time, so you don't have to, but number 207 is the opening hymn, and then right after the sermon, the response... Uh, song is 392, hymn number 392. So 207 and 392. And um, our co-ed Bible study on the Sabbath will begin this Wednesday, since last Wednesday I didn't get to begin it, uh, being out with COVID. So uh, if you are interested in joining us for that, we'll start 10 o'clock this Wednesday. And um, we're thinking of moving that to Thursdays, but we'll see who shows up on Wednesday and kind of take a poll on that. But uh, that's open to anybody who'd like to come. We're going to be talking about how to rest in this uh, busy world. And um, I know that Cindy had an announcement. Did she wanted to make? Yeah. Um, so Christian Ed Wow. Mm -hmm. Christian Ed Wow is going really well on Wednesday nights. So it's been really fun to have these kids back. Um, We've, it's been a couple of years, but we have done a, a 65 envelope fundraiser before for Christian Ed and WOW. Um, so the basic concept is envelopes are marked 1 to 65, and then the thought is to put a um, dollar all the way up to $65 in the envelopes. So I do have those, and I can set them back on the table. Um, we can pass them around, too. Um, and then you can either put them in the offering or put them in the basket back on the table. And we do appreciate your offering because um, we're looking for some new games for the kids and then um, activities and different things like that that we can get back into with um, everything kind of returning to normal this year. So, yeah, great. And I think there's probably still a sign-up out there for volunteering uh, if y'all want to get signed up. Um, also, today is fourth Sunday, so there is fellowship. I hear that Ann Beavers is back there at, hard at work, and she's got some goodies for you. So um, right after service today, um, she is putting on fellowship, so please stay if you can. We'll also be having our session meeting uh, make up from last week. Um, so uh, session members, please get you some treats and refreshments, and then we'll be meeting in the classroom. Um, are there any other announcements from the congregation? Okay, let us worship God. Please stand for the call to worship. Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus Christ, who rules over all things, gathers us in love. Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. Let us offer our praise and thanksgiving.
O Lord our God, we give you thanks for the grace that is at work in us through the gift of our baptism, the sign of your threefold name, the communion of your faithful people, the promise of your glorious realm. By the power of your Holy Spirit, poured out upon us in the baptism, let uh, your grace and peace grow in us until we gather at your heavenly throne to give you thanks and praise forever. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Now for our call to confession. Looking at Jesus, to, at looking at Jesus, we see that we have fallen short of the glory of God, yet Jesus looks at us with mercy and grace. Therefore, let us offer our confession in faith. Let us join in the prayer of confession. God, God of, of justice, justice and righteousness, and you lift up the lowly and fill the empty, yet we adore the high and the mighty. You reach out to the poor, yet we ceaselessly pursue wealth. You talk about treasure in heaven, yet we want dollars in our accounts right now. Correct our misguided ways. Forgive our lack of generosity. Free us from striving for more and more. Change our hearts so that we can tend to the things that matter and find our life in Jesus Christ. Amen. Without regard for the cost, the precious love of God is poured out in Jesus Christ. This is good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and made new. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us share the peace of Christ with one another. For our scripture today is from um, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 19. But godliness with contentment is great, is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a, is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves w with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee all this 
and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses, in the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Jesus Christ, who, will test, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession. I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. This is the word of God. Thank you. I'll pray your prayer of illumination. Holy God, thank you for this time together. I thank you that you are here among us. You were here long before we ever arrived, that your anointing fills this room, that fills each and every one of us, that the anointing breaks the yoke, it frees us, it helps us to have eyes to see, hearts that are softened to receive your word, the seed of your word. So God, help me to, in to decrease so that you may increase. I love how whatever I say, God, you take that word for what you intend it, and it goes to the heart of every person here, and you cause by your Holy Spirit them to hear exactly what they need to hear for today, that you feed your sheep. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. So today, our main scripture, we're, we're kind of in the big umbrella, remember, of the love revolution. We're going to be talking about that for a while, the love revolution and what that really means. We're in that reboot section. We're in the fourth message of the reboot, uh, which is kind of, you know, when school started and fall starts and all the busy schedules start again. The summer uh, is kind of resting and relaxing usually, and then the fall starts and everybody's busy again. And so we kind of had a four uh, message reboot, and this is the last one of that section. It's called Rethink Happiness. And the main scripture that I'll be looking at is from 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 8, which says, Of course, there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment. For we brought nothing into this world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. And um, I've got a story about John Wesley. I love all these theologians, whether they're Calvin or not. <laughs> They've got lots of good ones from the Methodists and the Luthers, Lutherans. But um, John Wesley, when he attended Oxford University, he was 21. And he came from wealth and privilege from uh, high intelligence, he had the looks, he had you know, a, a family of power, and one night he met a porter uh, without a bed, he didn't have proper clothing or a coat, it was very cold outside, and he had very little to his name. So a very poor person, and finding this porter in very good spirits and in gratitude, he, Wesley sarcastically said, you thank God when you have nothing to wear, nothing to eat, and no bed to lie upon? What else do you thank him for? The porter smiled and humbly replied, I thank him that he has given me my life and being, and a heart to love him, and a desire to serve him. The porter moved Wesley that night. He helped him realize the true meaning of contentment. 
and that provision came from the Lord and not his circumstances. And this made me think of um, the actor Jim Carrey, um, who I don't see in many movies anymore, but back in the 80s, he was in quite a, quite a few movies, and he said something I find profound. He said, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so that they can see that it's not the answer. And I have found this really to be very true and apply to thinking about different stances of groups who fight against one another, who have stances that they're so committed to, um, the political wars that are currently so familiar in our land, the social issues that divide the church, and so on. I wonder if they no longer had to fight for anything, but it was given to them freely would they experience the contentment that they so long to experience through winning the fight? I don't know. It's, it's really stuck with me a long time. I know for myself, I'm a very goal-driven, tenacious person. And as tenacious as I am, when I've achieved the things I've worked so hard for in myself, if, it was, if the motive was to prove something to someone else or to make myself appear more than I am, um, to overcome some insecurity, to set myself up higher, if it was to prove something or to please someone, I found myself wanting and empty after achieving that goal. I also know the joy and contentment found in staying committed with long suffering in a situation that I didn't choose, yet knowing that God led me there and was with me and he had authored the journey. That is a whole different kind of contentment and satisfaction. And there's no contentment like going on an adventure that you know Jesus has initiated. No matter where the path may lead or the obstacles or the pain, because there will be those. And the progress will come along the way. So often we run to things of this world to solve our problems instead of turning to the one who created us in the first place. The Apostle Paul is who we're talking quite a bit about in this section. He shares some hard-fought wisdom with us here in Philippians 4, 12, and 13. He says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, for I can do all of these things through Christ who gives me strength. So when Paul said this, he was speaking to the Philippian church at that time, and he was talking to them about their financial giving, um, that they were sending financial aid to him when he was in need. And he was explaining that, hey, it's so kind of you all to send me this need, to send me this money. I appreciate you being kind and generous and thinking of me. But even if you had not that through Christ, no matter what condition I find myself in, I don't have to manipulate you for money. I don't have to send letters to get you to send money because I have found this secret to true happiness and contentment. And if I'm abasing or abounding, it does not matter because I've found this wholeness and this peace in Christ. He's not living for the accolades or the appreciation for, from humanity, but his whole focus, his whole ambition is to however I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. That's what Paul's whole theology is about. That's from Acts 20, 24. He feels that his, whole, his entire purpose is to take on what God has given him, and that's to testify to the good news of God's grace to anybody in his path. And then again, Paul shares with us the entire way of being when he is at the end of his life, and this is part of Timothy, 1 Timothy, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy 4, 7 through 8. And you know this one well, I'm sure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And on not, not only to me, but also to those who have longed for his appearing. I will then hear the reason for all. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into your inheritance. I believe that everyone here 
uh, longs to hear those words and see God smile on their life. Now, we can see the character and philosophy. I've kind of laid that foundation of Paul's understanding of money. And the reason for being in this world, we can take a look at his message to Timothy today. Because the setting for today is Paul talking to, we talk about this, Timothy, this younger minister, and Paul is mentoring Timothy. Paul is not speaking to the wealthy here in this discourse. He's not speaking to the church. He's not talking to the church about money. He's speaking honestly with another partner in ministry about what he fears for the people he shepherds. It says, 1 Timothy Just the verse that I read at the very beginning. Of course, there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world, so we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. For me, I feel like it's unfortunate that in churches today, we struggle to talk talk openly about money, tithing, and generosity, being blessed, and about how we can become more faithful in terms of how we manage our money. When I taught uh, 10th grade geometry in Odessa, Texas, I was amazed at the lack of financial literacy of the kids in 10th grade. We talked uh, through proofs and logic problems involving money, and I had this room full of eyes just like it was a foreign concept staring back at me. Confusion. And I learned that in order to teach them the higher order thinking skills of logic and proofs that they would need, I'd have to go back to the very basic financial literacy skills and fill in all those gaps before we could move forward into those higher order thinking. And I see financial matters in the church in a very similar way. It's hard to, as a, as a pastor to talk about money in church because we've all been saddled with this uh, great, a great deal of financial manipulation from TV preachers and ministries. They tell us, you know, you're going to receive this. If only you'll send me 1995 and I'll send you this prayed over uh, whatever, <laughs> this little bottle of water. And uh, we all tire of hearing how we are to prosper financially from God, yet the only ones that seem to be prospering are flying around in jets and own multiple mansions all over the world. These are the ones preaching from the TV screens. But even with all of the reasons and excuses and the cynicism we have about money, the church needs to be talking about money because it's mentioned in Scripture over 800 times. Uh, anything to do with money and stewardship, it's mentioned over 800 times. It's the second most referenced topic in the Scripture. So if Scripture openly deals with issues of money that many times then in the body of Christ can surely talk about it in church, right? (laughs) So in our text today, Paul is tackling the dangers of materialism. You know, we talk about, um, I think sometimes people say that money is evil, but that's not at all what the text is talking about. He's talking, Paul is talking to Timothy about how when people engage in the love of money when they put money above they put uh, any kinds of things you know we all have those vices or those things that we tend to place above hearing the voice of God or choosing these things uh, to provide comfort to us over going to prayer or going to the scripture uh, to connect with God for comfort and he's he's talking about this dangers of materialism because um Whether you have money or you don't have money, whoever you are, the character of who you are, once you're given more money, you're just a bigger that, (laughs) whatever you are. Uh, Your character, if it's solid and good, then the more money you're given, you're still the same, you still have that same character. But if you are broken and have a fallen character, Um, you're still going to be that when given more money. So I believe that's what Paul is really talking about when he talks about the the snares of money and um, the dangers of materialism. Because it's not to induce feelings of guilt or shame from any of us, especially from among the wealthy. Because remember, he's not writing to the wealthy. He's not even talking to them. And he's not trying to raise money for his cause here either. 
He's a pastor talking to another pastor about a cycle that he sees harming the people of the church. And the text gives us an opportunity to co confront one of the chief spiritual struggles of our day, too, without handing out a pledge card. <laughs> at issue here is contentment, the power of being at peace with what we have and who we are right now on the way to where we're going. One of the most devastating ways sin manifests itself in our lives is through the desperate attempt to address a spiritual hunger with a material object. Advertising agencies, they specialize in helping us with this <laughs> to discover the thing that we need so much and we didn't even know it existed. In the United States, we have a thriving self-storage industry dedicated to all of our extra stuff, <laughs> our objects that no longer meet an immediate need, but that we we'll hold on to just in case. <laughs> According to most experts, Fights about money remain the number one cause of marital strife. Amen. <laughs> and the most prosperous age in human history that we have now, the desire to have more has never been more powerful. It's no wonder that the gospel's commands against materialism still fall on deaf ears because it's a word of confrontation to all of us. But it's also a word of hope even for those of us with self-storage units. And just so you know, I'm always preaching to myself every time I get up here, and especially today. The word that God has for all of you is the same word that God has for me, and I get to eat it first and walk with it all week before bringing it to you. So I always preach from a place of living this and being convicted myself over and over again and calling out on the Lord for myself to receive mercy and grace, especially in this area of materialism. It's something that I really struggle with because it creeps into every area of our lives very gently. And then before you know it, you have to have this next thing or that thing or what will I do without that? Or if I don't have these things, then I, I don't have the materials that I need to complete that. And I need to complete it. <laughs> But the text asks some challenging questions about where we place our hope. Not to condemn those in a certain income bracket, but to liberate all of us shackled by our stuff. Paul and Timothy alike would be taken aback by the wealth of most Northern American Christians. Through material, though materialism has a way of numbing us to what we've already got. It's telling that most of us think of the wealthy as anyone who has more than we currently do because the need for more can breed only perpetual discontent with what you have and a persistent focus on what's parked in the neighbor's driveway and what you have missing. You know, I, I have, um, Ed and I had changed, both of our vehicles, we were pretty much gas guzzlers. You all knew my expedition, it was super old, it had, 200 and something uh, thousand miles on it and uh, we traded them in for Subarus and I am just in love with this car. Everything about it I'm in love with. And then I started seeing these articles about all the things wrong with it, you know, these negative things like this and that. And I read one and I'm like, I told Ed, I will not be reading any more of that because it actually makes you discontent. It makes you start looking for what's wrong. And it's just a natural example to this message because I'm like, the more we look for the things that are wrong, we totally miss what God is doing right here and right now. And I think that Paul is really digging home that if we begin to look for what is right first and begin to have that gratitude for what we have right now, then it really is the first step in overcoming specifically materialism, but all other things that we might turn to instead of turning to God at that spiritual hunger that we have. We can't experience healing if we are unwilling to let Paul deliver the diagnosis to us. While we don't lift it up as a virtue as often as we should, we all notice when we encounter someone who is completely content. You know, if you've been on a mission trip, they, you always hear this familiar re refrain, they had so little, but they seemed to have so much joy. 
what this most often results in is an unsatisfying sense of guilt that the wealthier participant should be happy with what they have because these with so little have so much joy. But at heart, it's not about guilt. It's not about to make us feel bad because we're not grateful enough. It's an invitation to see happiness in a completely new way. Not that someone can be happy with less, but that you have, sorry, but what you have has little or no bearing on happiness at all. Our stuff doesn't equal happiness or unhappiness. Listen to that again. It's not that someone can be happy with less, but that what you have has little or no bearing on happiness at all. Perhaps the most challenging reboot of all is learning holy satisfaction, the practice of relentless gratitude coupled with faith in Jehovah Jireh, our provider. So I've been talking a little bit about Rosh Hashanah on the Jewish calendar, and today, actually last night began Rosh Hashanah, but today is like day one of Rosh Hashanah. It's the first day of the Jewish New Year, and I've talked briefly about before, and even though we don't adhere to the Jewish customs and rituals, it's a wise thing to understand the seasons and the times that God still operates in all forms of times. Rosh Hashanah is a religious and festive time when family and friends gather together for meals and worship, intentionally growing closer to God. It's a time for looking forward to a new year with anticipation and reflecting on the past year to give guidance to how we might pray for God's grace to help us grow in these new areas for this next season. There are many symbols used during this time right now and all the way through Advent, the beginning of Advent on November 27th. And it speaks of abundance, blessing, God's favor, and the good old year of Jubilee that I've talked to since the very first day I got here. So one practice I would like for us all to practice during this spiritual new year that begins today is to begin and end our day with three gratitudes. You may already do this, and that's awesome if you do. And if you don't do this at all, and if six a day seems just unbearable, um, try one a day. And I'm personally committing to write them down in some format. I have like an electric journal and then I have a written one. I don't know which one I'll use for that. But I am committing to write it down every day to have three things I'm grateful for each morning and three things I'm grateful for about my day each night before bed. So I'll look throughout the day and just find three things that made me feel full um, that I'm grateful for. And I ask each of you to join me in that, even if you can only think of one. I challenge you to keep a written record of these things over the next year, beginning right now during Rosh Hashanah. It's my prayer for all of us that this time next year will bring not only the fruit and harvest of the year of Jubilee, but also transformed hearts that are able to experience this reboot of happiness and contentment where we can each truly say that I live with holy satisfaction and I am content and fully satisfied with life just as it is and with myself just as I am on my way to where I'm going. May you live out this challenge with joy and peace this year, this spiritual new year, knowing that there is one that goes before us who leads us into contentment. There is one that walks alongside of us whose peace passes all understanding. And there's one who lives within us that is constantly transforming us into new creations in Christ, who has learned the blessing found in a life of holy satisfaction. And the church said? Amen. 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 Now our response song, hymn number (laughs) 392. We have number 392.
Good morning. It's the fourth Sunday, and so we always have our Minute for Mission. And next Sunday is October 2nd. It's World Communion Sunday, so that is a special day in our church. It's also a, the day that we have our Peace and Global Witness offering. So I want to remind everybody about that. And today's Minute for Mission talks about that and talks about being led forth in peace. The words of Isaiah 55 convey a profound message to us during a season of peace. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. Go out in joy. Well, when we look around our world these days, it's sometimes hard to feel joyful. Yet joy inherently embraces optimism. And I think this ties in really well with Pastor Nicole's message this morning. Joy is the companion of faith and hope. In our polarized world, torn, torn by war, famine, marginalization of the poor, and disenfranchised, we are in desperate need of joyful and brave people who are willing to ask the hard questions and live the difficult solutions that make peace possible. Be led forth in peace. Through the Peace and Global Witness offering, we connect with each other as the church together to confront systems of injustice and promote reconciliation in places around the world and right here at home. And the Peace and Global Witness offering is one of our four special offerings that we do every year. And that offering itself, 25%, we can keep as a congregation for our own peacemaking activities. 25% is used by the mid-councils. And 50% is used by the, uh, the Presbyterian Mission Association or Ministry Association to convey peace and do peace-making activities throughout the world. So it's a very, very important offering for our church. Next week, for those of you who are here able to join us in, in church, we will have um, envelopes for the Peace and Global Witness offering. Um, for those of, who, of you who might be unable to join us and want to contribute, you can send a check uh, to the, the treasurer and just note on it, Peace and Global Witness, or by Venmo, just add that in the comments in case you'd like to donate for that. So we will have that next week, and thank you very much. Now for the call for the offering. I appeal you, brothers and sisters, to present yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Let us offer our lives to the Lord through the giving of our tithes and offerings. Let us receive the offering.
thanks and praise, O oh God, for you have chosen the poverty of the world to make your people rich in faith. Help us to put our faith into practice through the offering of our lives, giving food to the hungry, clothes to the naked, and shelter to the poor, all for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord, your word made flesh. Amen. Now time for joys and concerns. I have two today. I have a joy. Um, my son, Ryan, through the grace of God and AA, has been sober for 10 years. Wow. Yes. <laughs> And then I ask for prayers for Tina Cantrell. She's a librarian at the Dallas Center Library. She's been diagnosed with a very rare tumor cancer in her, right above her tailbone, in her, and it's wrapped around her bones and nerve endings. So if you'd keep her and her family in our prayers, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Lord, Lord and in your mercy, hear our prayers. Um, I don't, Jeannie usually comes through on something, and I, um, she has a stress fracture in her left foot, and she's in a boot for six weeks and still is in pain. And then, what a joy. If you didn't look in the corner outside, the shepherds have been working on getting that beautiful and I don't think it's completely done, but um, very close. So pay attention to that and thank the shepherds for their work. Lord, in, in your, your mercy, mercy hear, hear our prayers. There's nothing online other than uh, Carl and Tom are in Okaboji, and of course Jimmy's in Texas. <laughs> Let us pray. Lord, hear our prayers today as we come to your throne of grace. Father, we especially pray today for those who are ignored or neglected, left to suffer in our world, those who live in poverty within our own town and region, those who are lying in great suffering at the gates of our nation. God, bind your people together and make us bright and shining witnesses to your compassion and your grace as they are revealed in the law and the prophets and in Jesus Christ, the one you raise from the dead. Lord, hear our prayers. Here too we pray the petitions and the intercessions of our hearts and for those who govern and are in authority in our world, for those who are lost in sin and despair, for those who need healing, and for those who seek to serve as Jesus served. We especially hold before you today all those spoken and unspoken requests here today. Hold each one with special care and promise resolution through your love, grace, and mercy. We ask all these things and we give to you our thanks and praise and our minutes and our days through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray as one family, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For your benediction today. Keep trusting in the Lord and do what is right in God's eyes. Fix your heart on the promises of God and you will dwell in the land feasting on his faithfulness and harvest. Find your delight and true pleasure in Yahweh and he will give you what you desire the most. Give God the right to direct your life 
And as you trust him along the way, you'll find he pulled it off perfectly. He will appear as your righteousness, as sure as the dawning of a new day. He will manifest as your justice, as sure and strong as the noonday sun. May the peace of God, the power of Jesus Christ, and the manifest presence of the Holy Spirit carry you through this week until we see each other again. Amen.